Today's question uh, in the metaverse education arena is, which innovations are necessary to make metaverse education more interesting? Mm. Now we'll go to Selby, who will ask Dieter a question. Well, well actually, <laughs> uh, before I ask a question, um, I want to out outline the, the dimensions of the problem a little bit. Um, the, um, the, we, well, first, you, you said more interesting. More interesting than what? More interesting than they used than they have been up to now, or more even more interesting than than regular classrooms, which, as I recall, and I and, and I checked back recently too, is it, are extremely boring. Um, but uh, actually, but I, I'm um, I'm going to suggest the the technology. We don't need any improved technology. Uh, to make the classes more interesting, we need what we need is an improved creativity on the parts of whoever is designing the courses. Yeah, I agree there. Also, interesting here means more engaging or to make the audience an active part of a lecture, not just a passive uh, group of listeners. Mm. That's a good. That's a, definitely a point, and uh, that's one of the technology elements that we can use. Because um, when you stand up and give a lecture, well, actually, if you're a skilled lecturer, when you stand up and when you you every, about every ten minutes or seven minutes or such such a segment, you you stop and um, ask if there are any questions, or you pose a question to the audience. Uh, you, the audience, of course, can't answer it. Uh, rarely, you might actually let the, somebody in the audience hold up their hand, but usually, what you do is you pose the question and leave them, let them think for a short time, and then you give them the answer because you can't go, you can't listen, you can't afford to uh, you hear from the audience of several hundred people, maybe several hundred people. Uh, now, the thing that we can do in in a virtual world, we already have the technology to ask questions of individual or ask accept responses from individuals. So we can propose a question and they can supply the answer in t in chat, in text chat, um, and that all becomes then available. Actually, it's available during the lecture, though the lecture could not be could not actually review it, but somebody else can review it. Uh, and uh, um, so that's one of the things we can do. Um, I don't know that we're actually doing it. I've noticed that we're, I haven't noticed that we actually do that very much. I think that uh, when you get down to education, uh, we've got the usual issues, which I'm not going to delve in too much right now, uh, of acceptance and such. But I think that one of the things we need to do uh, is make creativity dead simple for them. Make it so that any old teacher with a very small learning curve can come in and make interactive uh, interactive lesson plans and interactive uh, regions where uh, the students can actually get involved in what they're doing. It's like uh, create physics demonstrations or uh, you know history make up uh, situations where the students are in the middle of it. Now, that by its very nature, some of those would take quite a bit of time, but uh, the other thing is, is if we have a quote-unquote metaverse that is uh, able to be uh, used by many people on different platforms where we have uh, standards of certain things, uh, we could have, you know, the group of creators uh, be able to sell or lease or give away uh, their interactive regions. And pretty soon you will have a uh, library of those interactive regions that uh, many, many instructors could use. Yeah. Uh, 
So basically a marketplace, yeah. kind, kind of like teachers pay teachers, mm -hmm. but in 3D. Well, actually, you... you uh, yeah, you, I think... Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think what, what Steve is referring to is we, we need a kind of um, a library of interactive lectures. And right. this library will be, will be the result of the collaboration um, of three distinctive groups of people. First, of course, we have the bearers of knowledge, the lecturers, which will provide the essence uh, of the lecture. But then we will have things like immersive coaches, uh, which have the knowledge how to um, transfer knowledge in, in interactive or in, 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 in 3D environments. And we will have the instructional designer who then will be able to implement it in the, the given uh, format. And mm -hmm. I think these three yep. parts together will create this whole body of knowledge in the form of a digital library. Yeah, well, let me I, I, that you could actually uh, add in another thing that we are actually quite a, way, quite a ways into, and that is YouTube videos. Um, yes, videos, they're not by, the, by nature interactive, but they can be. If you give, if you give, you give people a 10-minute video, you can follow that with um, a, a bunch of questions. Um, some of which may cause them to go back, students to go back and look at the video again. Oh, but if and so you can evaluate. Oh, uh, and of course, if you if you really want to make it more interactive, what I would do is bring in, uh, form groups of students, and ask the gr each group to answer some questions about it. Oh, uh, and in that case, they interact with each other at the same time that they are interacting with the video. Yeah, well, now a good idea because especially breakout rooms in virtual worlds are rather cheap. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, that's 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 one of the things you don't really have in a classroom situation. You're all in that same room. Uh, space is quite available in a virtual world, and uh, that would be, you know, something where if you can get it even going further than that, uh, where students get to create their own yep. things in that in that world yep. uh, also should we also should think seriously about uh, artificial intelligence uh, yep. uh, what do they call NPCs non-player characters mm -hmm. yeah or the uh, digital teaching assistant the DTA yep. yeah or that same idea digital teaching assistant uh, <laughs> Those kind of things, especially if you could have them go out with uh, with the breakout groups and stuff like that, or be part of the experience. Uh, if you're doing a history class, you could have them being a major part of that experience, where the students are immersed in a thing. Uh, you know, you could do something. Well, January sixth, you could have a thing of what really happened at January sixth. Mm -hmm. Okay, and have all these uh, all these players. There'd have to be several hundred of them. <laughs> well, you wouldn't make but, several hundred, but, but you could. You know, but what, what was the situation? You know, yeah. being in the middle of that. What would you do, and why were you there, and that kind of thing? You know, mm -hmm. I think that people would learn a whole lot more about history if they were involved in it. Well, yes. For example, you you tell the student, you assign the yeah. students. You are news reporters, and you are going to make a report, you're going to form, form a new story about um, this whatever it is, and you know, the, the, the taking of the Alamo, to think, to think of one that has been, is widely available a long time ago, uh, the, mm -hmm. and you, you, going, you can go into the Alamo and talk to several of the Alamo leaders and ask them uh, about their position and what they hope will happen and what they think might happen. And yeah, and, um, and in that case, um, you make you your job is to make form a report about what about the Alamo, the siege of the Alamo, and what it uh, what effect it had uh, has. Or you you can also go to, to Sam Houston or some of the other people who survived <coughs> who did who were not at the Alamo, and you can ask them about uh, their opinion about the. the what happened at the Alamo? Okay, let's let's say there was no reports involved in this. 
no writing. Okay. What would you say if you had a situation where one kid could be the leader of one side, another kid can be another person in the other side, okay, and they were doing they were doing a um, role playing, mm -hmm. and you had a system that saw what they did role playing wise, and basically uh, pushed them. Not even so much pushed them, but rated them on how they handled the situation. Mm, yeah, well, actually, you could do that. And uh, one of the, the, the uh, alternative situation that occurs to me is you put them back into uh, into <coughs> Shakespeare's um, play of Julius Caesar. And you yeah, you, you throw them right into the situation, give them parts to do in the situation. Yeah, right. no, but they don't have to follow Shakespeare. The, the the script they can re they can change the script if they if they want to role play a, a different outcome for example. Well, yeah, you could. I think you'd probably want to do the historical thing first, mm -hmm. but then you could start messing with it and saying, well, what would happen if so and so did this right now? Mm -hmm. You know, and get the students to really think about it and the dynamics of what happened in that <laughs> situation. And the way people felt at that time, yeah. that you know, is, well, like the founding of our country and creating the Constitution. What happened back then? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, how did these things go? What were these guys thinking? And if you could make those things come alive, you'd have a situation where the kids would never forget it. Mm -hmm. If they were, if they're busily writing up a report and doing research, yeah, you can forget that. I mean, it's, you know, you're, you've got a test, well, I, I, you're going to learn enough to do the test, and you're out of there. Well, as a matter of fact, what you've got in that particular case is you've got an excellent story in, in for English students, because, of course, that mm -hmm. is a, a play actually c covered in many English classes in high school. Um, but you also have a, an excellent story for other uh, uh, for other purposes, because that is actually a historical event, um, and um, so you could, if you role, if you role play it, um, you would probably have various of the of the players uh, answering questions or, or or doing soliloquies um, about what they what they are going to do in, in this context. That, so basically, well, yeah, you could get them to write a uh, a play that takes Romeo and Juliet and puts it in a whole different thing. <laughs> yes, get right. You can put it right there in the West Side of New York if you wanted to. Well, yeah, well, that's West Side Story. <laughs> yes, well, that's the thing. The thing, the thing is, is that uh, I think you would understand literature a lot oh, best, yes. better uh, if you did it in an interactive way rather than the way that they've been doing it for centuries now. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, why, why wouldn't it be a? Why wouldn't it be a, even a story if they fell in love and their parents approved? Well, yeah. And and what would happen maybe after that? Maybe do uh, Romeo and Juliet uh, with a slight twist, and it starts out with all this stuff, like at the end of Romeo and Juliet, but without anybody dying, and uh, then they go on with their life and come up with new, different things that hit them. Yeah, now that's you know. what, we're do what we're doing. We're thinking of creative work ways to use the instructional material. Um, and uh, now what we can do about that is simply promote promulgate the, the idea. We can't do the do the actual um, rendering, but we can present the idea. And in fact, I'm I'm doing some of the that in my blog now. I'm act, I've, I've tried to focus on specific cases where what could how could you use a um, the, a virtual world for for specific contexts. Well, actually, so, such as language learning was one of my favorite topics because it is so much of a natural. <clears throat> I, I think that, uh, you know, there's going to have to be, there would have to be some demos done with that um, so that 
there was a situation where people could see what the idea was and get them involved in yeah. it, you know, uh, like, and that one, actually, if you were going to do Romeo and Juliet, the, uh, part two, uh, that one wouldn't be all that hard. All you'd really have to do is create a region that is, uh, set in that time, yep. you know, that kind of fits in with the whole Shakespeare era and the thing, give them a set of avatars with period clothes, you know, and, uh, kind of let them create, <laughs> you know, because kids are naturally creative yes. and, uh, let them do their thing. And the fun part is, is, they could they could actually sit down and write it down, but it would be much more fun if it was all improvisational. Oh yes, yes. Well, and, and, you know, yeah. Uh, well, give them a set of parameters and let them go for it. Yeah. This is one of the little things, like we're dealing with that uh, group in Florida now, uh, that I want to see if I can get those kids to do things that are out of the ordinary. Mm-hmm and uh, create within a virtual world uh, things that normally anybody would have thought of because we've got kids that are very smart and uh, very creative. It's an arts and music school. Let's do it. You know. Yeah, and they, are really, they are really motivated, I think. You just I think have so. seen uh, their, their videos. Uh, these are almost on a let's say, same professional level. Oh yeah, their videos are excellent, and yeah, and I, these are uh, <laughs> yeah, and all well, the other thing is is get them into machinima, use that virtual world as their stage, yeah, as their set. You know, uh, there's a whole pile of different things that can be done uh, in this kind of a thing, which which the education people really haven't latched on to yet. Uh, I mean, you can teach, you could teach civics in a virtual world in the old fashioned way and your people would go to sleep just like they do in regular class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They'd probably go to sleep even easier because they're in their home in a nice comfy chair, you know? So the thing is, is you want to get them involved in, in direct ways. And the idea like with the, with the location scene, the costumes, the lead up to it once you studied Romeo and Juliet, okay? And you could study Romeo and Juliet right in that scene. Oh, well, yeah. Do it right in that, you know, that uh, period, uh, period region. That wouldn't be all that hard to create. There's probably enough 3D models out there already right now to do it. Oh, uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure. I'm For sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, so uh, that's why I said the key is is to make the uh, the virtual world so that they're dead simple to create in. Okay, well, they, the building tools need to be really easy. The uh, scripting tools need to be really easy. You know, uh, everything needs to be at a level where just about anybody can use it with maybe an hour of. Uh, training to get you started and then within a week of using it you're not quite expert but you're pretty good at it you know because uh, teachers don't have time yeah. they don't have time well, to do I, anything yeah, well actually one of the things to realize is for many of these things <coughs> have, the teachers would not have to build anything uh, all of the techno all, all of the sets actually exist if you can look around and find them i would bet um, oh yeah, I'm sure that they're all out there. Uh, the thing, the thing is, is that uh, the key is the marketplace. Okay, having a scene, having a scene, and having the avatars set up in a in a marketplace, and uh, so that you could buy the whole package, yeah. or you can give away the whole package depending on how the person is doing it. If you do them for You know, forty nine ninety five for a whole setup. I'm sure schools would budget that. Yes. Okay. If it was five thousand dollars or five hundred dollars, probably not. But if the prices were reasonable, mm -hmm. uh, schools would lap that up. And the thing is, is the region should be made so that people can modify them. So they need to be 
you know, no uh, per open permissions. And uh, that way, somebody can take it from the marketplace, load it into a region, and uh, do what they want to with it. You know, maybe change some of the signage in there or whatever, and uh, move things around, uh, put in some other challenges, whatever. <coughs> uh, then they would have a an end result. And the end result would be a nice little place to learn something in. And uh, then once you do yours, you can say, okay, uh, I've got this. It goes this way. Put it up on the marketplace. So you'll have two versions of it then. Yeah, well, I, the, I just read an article about role playing, which is not going to publish for a while. But um, and, and I think actually what we're, one of the things we're pointing out is that many, many classes could use role playing and uh, this technology is already adequate to support the role playing and there's a very likely the only lo the only thing that is is missing is is the ability to find things I, um, find the um, sets that would uh, that sets all we know we're quite sure exist it would be a matter of how how is, is how can we help people find things Thank well, you, that's why, yeah, that's why Imworlds is uh, having a marketplace. That can be the beginning yeah. of it. And uh, we'll put our regions in there, and uh, if somebody wants to use something, uh, they can get it from the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could even have demo ones that they can go to. Every region could be set up in a in on a server where they can go look at this and go, oh, okay, Ooh. this looks really good. And and furthermore, you know, we could go there and we could do well. We could even do role playing there. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Role playing in virtual worlds goes way back. I mean, we're talking the the day Second Life opened. Uh, two days <laughs> yeah. after that, uh, people were role playing, and uh, they were busily their viewers were crashing all the time and stuff. Like I remember those days, well, and but you, still, you'd be doing your role playing. It was well, fun. It was interesting. I was doing and, role playing role playing before 1940. Now, I was a cowboy or an Indian, but I was doing role playing. Okay, so yeah, there's, well, you were a kid then. Yes, of course. Yeah, and so you were doing, you were doing what your idea of that role was. Yes. The thing is, is if you're doing it in an educational way, you can instruct them, you can teach them about what this role is and who, what that person's motivations are and, you know, what they would do in a certain situation. You know, it's like if you were doing Diary of Anne Frank. Yeah, but you I, could I do it in a, I was you know. Illustrating the point that all children do role playing spontaneously. You don't have to make them. Uh, oh yeah, my 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 two grandsons, my my son's two kids. Uh, we were just there here recently because my uh, my other grandson, the old grandson, graduated. These guys are like uh, five and six, you know, that kind of age. And they play together role-playing all the time. They naturally just get into it. And they're all around the house playing different roles, doing different <clears> things. <throat> you know, so it's, yeah. And the problem is, is if kids, as kids get older, they kind of lose that. No, I don't think they lose it. I think the schools train them not to do it. Well, it might be. Maybe the thing is, is we need to change the way education works. Well, uh, I'm, I'm definitely for that. Yeah, uh, but uh, actually, that's that's one of the things we're doing because you're saying what well, see one of the one of the problems that virtual worlds has is it, teaching in a virtual world. You do uh, as a teacher, you do not have a captive audience. When you have those kids in front of you, you have a captive audience. You look around and you watch them get bored, and you call on that student to, to answer a question, uh, and and of course that's going to form force them to pay attention because you because they're captives they can't get away from you <laughs>